Hi everyone. In this discussion, we're going to talk about scaffolding student learning within the zone of proximal development. This is intended as an introductory video, uh, and so therefore I'm expecting that many of you have a cursory, a beginning level understanding of scaffolding, uh, but not an expert level of understanding in zone of proximal development, and so I will be making other videos for students with a more expert understanding that are intended to build on this one. Uh, now, I also want you to know that this discussion really, really needs to be paired with observation of good teaching in action. Uh, for those of you that are in a, one of my classes that are not tied with active field experiences components, that's okay. I'm going to send you video clips of good teaching in action that have been recorded, and I'm going to uh, show you things to look for that go along with this discussion, because I do not believe that it is even remotely possible to learn how to expertly scaffold student learning and use some of the techniques we're going to uh, be discussing without actually thinking about good teaching in action and observing good teaching in action. Um, a discussion, listen to me talk with a pre-prepared PowerPoint is absolutely insufficient without the actual real world context being brought into play. So we want to activate prior knowledge. This is a good thing I'm going to do with you. And I also want you to think about ways in which you can always activate prior knowledge with your students too. Uh, because remember, your students will bring in their own unique backgrounds, their own unique experiences uh, to their learning that are different than yours. And so when we use a term like, in my case, scaffolding, it might mean something very different for me than it means for you as an individual based upon your background knowledge. Uh, when we use a term like reflection or reflective thinking, it might mean different things to different people. Uh, same thing goes when we talk about theme or tone in literature can mean different things to different people. And so it's very important to provide background knowledge activate prior thinking, um, prior visuals that might come to a student's mind and so forth. And frankly, just to make sure that you're talking on the same page as your students, because otherwise you might have certain assumptions going on in your head about what students are thinking, and it might be very different than what your students are thinking. So for instance, think in the case of this discussion, what does a scaffold mean to you? Um, if you've heard of the word before, uh, without uh, being involved in classroom discussion and before you did some of the readings that I will have you do in my classes, maybe you're thinking of a scaffold as a type of support. Uh, for instance, a person climbing a cliff um, and doing rock climbing oftentimes will have certain scaffolds to help make sure they don't just fall off that cliff unless you're doing free climbing, which is very dangerous, especially for a beginner. Um, a person that might be new to cliff climbing um, or might be climbing a very difficult, dangerous cliff um, would very much benefit from having things um, that help them grip and that help them make sure that if they fall down, they don't just free fall, they're caught. Um, a scaffold can be thought of as support systems that are in place. If you're climbing a ladder to a roof, um, it helps to have that ladder instead of just trying to free climb that um, wall without a ladder, and it helps to have gloves to help you grip that ladder. These are all forms of scaffolds, support systems that are in place. Um, if you're learning to ride a bike as a young child, it helps to have um, more expert bike riders, including parents, adults, uh, coach you first on how to ride that bike, and it helps to have training wheels. Now, eventually, the goal in helping a young child learn to ride a bike is for that child to gain expertise and independence as a bike rider. Same thing goes with other forms of scaffolds. 
whether you're talking about a think aloud as a student is doing their reading, or you're thinking about a timely tip, a timely clue, a timely reminder to look for something, a timely reminder to think about what you already know, a timely reminder to um, look for um, the beginning of the word, look for the ending of the word, and think and use little tips about the root or the prefix or the affix of a word to help you figure out a word. These are all forms of scaffolds. Um, look for when you're reading a paragraph. Uh, if you get stuck on a particular part of a paragraph, try to chunk that down into what the beginning of that paragraph might say. Look for context clues. These are all forms of scaffolds. Now, the goal is not to uh, make it so that the child has a sense of learned helplessness. The goal is always to gradually withdraw the support uh, so that the student can read and do math and do science or whatever the subject area is with increasing independence and increasing skill. So what does this imply? It implies that it's important in a formative as well as summative way. Remember formative and summative assessment. Formative means basically you're assessing in the act of that student learning. Um, a summative assessment would be things like the chapter exam, chapter uh, quiz, um, learning uh, for mastery of what does that child know at the end of doing something. Um, to put it very roughly, uh, you want to use multiple forms of assessments. A diagnostic assessment would be similar to when you're diagnosing a car. My car is using, you know, hopefully you can picture people laughing at that on a video, but uh, my car is making funny noises, and you so you take the car into um, an expert person like working with cars, and they do a di diagnosis on what exactly is causing that funny sound with that engine. Same thing goes with diagnostic assessment. Uh, in student learning, in reading skills, and in math skills. You find out why specifically that student um, might be struggling. You diagnose the particular issue. Maybe it's an issue uh, with uh, learning how to blend letter sounds together. Uh, maybe it's an issue related uh, to how to break words down and put words back together that uh, deals with phonics. Uh, maybe it's an issue with phonemic awareness, uh, making sense out of the um, letter sounds and the word sounds of this. Maybe it's an issue with fluency, fluency being your ability to read with appropriate pace and tone and pronunciation. Uh, uh, maybe it's an issue with vocabulary. Uh, maybe the vocabulary um, on the text um, is really confusing the student. So you want to find out exactly what the issue is that's causing that student to have uh, difficulties. Maybe it's an issue with decoding and encoding um, words that deals with phonics types of skills. At the extreme end of struggling with decoding, you might be dealing with dyslexia. Um, it's important to know exactly why that student is struggling uh, so that you can uh, gear your instruction appropriately because if you misdiagnose uh, why that student is struggling, then of course you're going to give the wrong type of teaching and the wrong type of intervention to that student that won't necessarily help. There's no point in teaching that student bunch of comprehension strategies necessarily if that student is dealing with decoding issues. You've got to fit, address those decoding issues and deal with the comprehension strategies. If you do them both together, then the comprehension strategies make sense. On the other hand, if that student does not have a problem with decoding, and now you're giving a bunch of interventions that are related to decoding, but that student isn't struggling in that area, you've just simply misdiagnosed. Now, 
you're probably insulting that student because that student might be feeling like, okay, this is basic. I'm not, I'm not struggling in this area. Why are you, why are you doing this? And you're, and you're intervening in a way that the student doesn't even need. All of this deals with zone of proximal development. It deals with scaffolding. It deals with the importance of making sure that you give the right scaffolding at the right time in the right way. Uh, to that student. You want to meet that student exactly where that student is and give the right type of assistance so that you can help that student gear toward increasing independence. So we deal with social constructivism here. Social constructivism is at the root of the zone of proximal development, which we'll study later in this discussion, as well as scaffolding. Uh, social constructivism is different than behaviorism, for instance. You might remember from other discussions that we've had, uh, for instance, empiricism versus rationalism. Um, if you've been part of those discussions, empiricism uh, dealing with there is real world out there. It's a little bit more passive. It's more authoritative in its approach. Um, rationalism uh, deals with uh, we make constructive sense of the world of the world through our minds. Um, a social constructivism is very much rooted in the rationalist school of thought. For those of you that have studied that uh, part, Vygotsky is not the only uh, theorist uh, who is associated with social constructivism, and in fact, there are a great many associated. Um, Piaget, Dewey, uh, Jerome Bruner. Uh, but Vygotsky is uh, one of the foremost people associated with scaffolding, and certainly the ZPD, Zone of Proximal Development, uh, comes from Vygotsky's uh, standpoint. I want you to understand that Vygotsky died a long time ago, and in fact, he was only 38 when he did die. Many of his writings were very formative. Uh, they were still in the process of being built. Um, a person at age 38 isn't as expert as they will be when they are 58 or 68. Um, he probably would have um, contributed far more to the field had he lived another 30, 40 years. And in fact, if you read his writings very carefully uh, when you are in grad school, if you get your doctoral degree and so forth and really study his writings in depth, what you find is that as some of his uh, scholars have said, some of his ideas actually contradicted with themselves. For instance, he, when, his, when he was early in his career, he was dealing more with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, um, the teacher-student. Then later in his career, he started dealing more actively with group learning, the group context. Um, and so his ideas were beginning to change, reshape, as he died of tuberculosis. Uh, so many, that's important for you to know because I get the impression that many students look at these scholars we talk about, whether it's Vygotsky, Piaget, and there's this impression that the scholarship stops with the author um, and that we take the ideas of these authors as they are. We cannot make any changes and it's this authoritative um, set in stone approach. That's not the way science works at all. That's not the way research works at all. Uh, we actively investigate. We actively explore. There are many scholars that are building on Vygotsky's ideas, um, adapting, even changing as new evidence arise. Um, and so when we talk about a Vygotskyan approach, we're not talking about uh, we just simply take something that Vygotsky wrote some 80 years ago, um, or more than 80 years ago, um, a great deal more than 80 years ago. Now it's, uh, what, what in some cases, 90, 100 years ago. Um, and just simply plopping it in, set in stone. No, that's not the way it works. We're dealing with active scholarship that is increasingly changing. Um, same thing goes with your students. Just like scholarship is active, your children are active learners. Just like scholarship in research is social, learning is social among your students. Um, 
This means that in a social constructivist classroom, the learning is not just simply passive, where it's a teacher on a stage lecturing his students, similar to what I'm doing right now, uh, with the students just simply sitting back and taking it all in passively. No, it's constructive. The students are dialoguing with each other. They're uh, putting their hands on blocks if they're young children. They're manipulating tools. Uh, they are exploring. They're dealing with experiments. That's another reason why it's so important for you to watch some of the video clips that I'm going to be uh, sending you to along with this discussion. Because very bluntly speaking, I am not modeling the social constructivist approach, uh, even as I'm talking about it right now. Um, the social constructivist approach needs to include active activities. And so it's impossible uh, to really learn what it means to be a social constructivist teacher if your model is someone uh, talking to you on the other side of a computer screen looking at a tiny little uh, video camera. Um, I can tell you the concepts, I can tell you the ideas, and I can refer you to things to read, but you really need to observe and you need to apply this in practice. It's not going to truly make sense to you until you apply things in practice. Same thing goes for your students in the social constructivist approach. You can teach your students these mathematical concepts or reading concepts or social studies concepts, uh, whatever your subject area is. But students need to have minds on, they need to have hands on, they need to be doing, they need to be exploring in its also constructivist sense. An important point here with social interaction and self-talk, think of young children when they are So think of young children when uh, you've got a parent uh, of this little baby going ba ba boo boo and gaga and rattling the rattle at the at the young child. That's how the young child is picking up on social cues. That's how eventually that young child picks up on language. Um, so the child doesn't know anything about language when the child is is newborn, and so the ability to self talk especially language-based self-talk, is preceded by social interaction. This continues throughout life. Our social interactions are formative in terms of the internal self-talk, especially language-based internal self-talk, with language being a tool for self-talk. Okay, so here are some keys to effective literacy instruction. Literacy meaning reading, writing, language arts, um, and overall good instruction in general. So you first of all want to make sure that you are maintaining high expectations for your students. That's high expectations that are also within the zone of proximal development. We'll learn more about the ZPD as we go forward, but the ZPD in general is the difference between what a student can do independently and what a student can do um, maximum uh, with assistance. And you want to avoid that frustration zone, which is in the area of what a student is incapable yet of doing. That CPD is right. It's kind of this Goldilocks area in between. So what does that mean in terms of your expectations? Your expectations need to be tied with assessment of what that student is capable of doing. Um, you need to assess what that student can currently do independently in the subject area that you're teaching. Um, you need to assess what this, what's the maximum that the student is currently capable of doing, as well as at what point does the student become frustrated because this is beyond what the student is capable of doing. 
your expectations need to be high for high growth. If you're if you've got low expectations and all you're really going to expect that student to do is repeat and regurgitate a bunch of things that student can already do, well that's going to lead toward boredom or you're going to expect low levels of growth just barely above what that student can independently grow. Uh, but it's going to be slow, very slow growth. That's not what you want to do. You want to you want to have high expectations for growth, uh, where that student is being challenged um, and stretching their skills, stretching their abilities. But you don't want that student to get frustrated without assistance and without guidance either. That's where that's where good teaching comes in. That's where good think alouds and tips and modeling and mentoring comes in and coaching and conference sessions comes in for that student. You want to provide models of good academic and literate behavior. So when you're reading with students, model to them how you think through a difficult word. Model through uh, for them your reading strategies, your thinking strategies when you write with students, for instance, writing workshops and so forth. Model for them how a good writer engages in writing, your thinking strategies as a writer. If you are a science teacher and you've got students doing science experiments, don't just simply turn students loose without any modeling. Model for them your own thinking process as a science teacher, as a, as a trained scientist even, um, because by the time you complete your, your degrees, if you've got a bachelor's degree and you're a science teacher, uh, hypothetically, uh, if you are a bachelor's student, I make these videos for multiple types of students, but um, with a bachelor's degree, you should have enough science background if you're teaching science that you know the scientific method. And so model that uh, thinking process for students. How do you walk through that scientific method, the hypothesis, the testing, the drawing of conclusions uh, for students? You want to uh, get students' own perspective. That means finding out what is the student thinking based upon evidence. Don't just do this talk show approach to education in which a student can give any opinion they want based upon no evidence whatsoever and nothing is ever right or wrong or whatever. There are times for that, I suppose, depending on context. But if you're talking about learning, if you're talking about growth, then get that student to give you their evidence, their background knowledge. Uh, get that student to tell you why are they saying something and coach them into strategic forms of reasoning. You want to promote diversity as a positive resource. That means different sources of knowledge. That means, for instance, if you're teaching a language, drawing upon different languages, different dialects as tools, as cues, instead of just simply this uh, only one way of thinking and only one way of reasoning. Uh, there is an approach, uh, for instance, called the funds of knowledge approach that you'll learn more about as we go in, uh, more into this uh, course, um, funds of knowledge, Louis Mull, where you draw on the families, the students' background knowledge as a fund of knowledge, kind of like a bank, uh, that you can draw upon as a strength, as an asset that informs your instruction, informs your curriculum planning, instead of viewing that student and that family and that community as a pure deficit. Um, elastic instructional approaches means that you are flexible. You're willing to change based upon new evidence and based upon your students. That means you've got to be skilled at this change. You can't just fly into chaos. But at times during your instruction, you might look around the room and you might find that your students are bored. Um, a bored student is more likely to act up. Um, a bored student or a frustrated student is more likely to um, engage in disruptive classroom, uh, classroom behaviors. 
And so one form of good classroom management, yes, you want to include the, the rules and the, and, the be, and the behavioral supports that behaviorism will talk about. But one form of classroom management is just simply to engage the students. It's to, um, if you see that your students are bored, get them engaged. Um, make adjustments to your instruction so that you hit off that boredom before it becomes a problem. Um, flexible grouping strategies are important. Um, there are times when you might want to group your students with like-minded skills so that they can build on each other. There are other times when you might want to group your students so that you've got an ex a more expert student helping the less expert students. Be flexible that way and be strategic that way, depending on the context. To differentiate instruction, we've looked at that already some in this course, uh, but different to differentiate instruction in a nutshell means that you are adjusting your instruction. You're using different strategies to meet the needs of students where they are at. So further on the sociocultural approach to learning, Remember that active activities in the classroom take place within the social and cultural context, and you cannot ignore the social and cultural context. You want to make sure uh, that you are conveying to children the way that their culture interprets and responds to the world and, and learn about this. Uh, everyone has certain meanings that are attached to objects, events, experiences that are social based, that are cultural based, and we need to be responsive to that. Here's some more basics of what we mean by the sociocultural approach to learning. Children can perform more challenging tasks with assistance for more experienced others. That's at the root here I go into the zone of proximal development. A child's actual development is the upper limit of what a child can perform individually. It takes assessment to know this. Um, a child's level of potential development is the upper limit of what a child can perform with assistance. The zone of proximal development is that distance between what a child can do um, in terms of actual development and what a child can do in terms of potential development. So again, this is where assessment comes in, um, as well as good teaching comes in. You want to assess what the child can do individually, the maximum of what that child can do individually, assess the maximum of what a child can do with assistance and guidance, that ZPD is in between. And according to the zone of proximal development, according to Bogoski, the ZPD is the optimal place where learning um, can occur for, the, uh, for children, as well as for adults. Children can perform more challenging tasks with assistance from more experienced and capable others. That means guidance, that means scaffolding, tips, cues, supports. When observing children at play, for instance, if you're teaching young children playing with blocks, it's important to take note of both what they can do independently as they're do, eat, working with these blocks as well as what they can do with assistance. When observing over time, you should be able to see growth. That, it's true whether you're teaching middle schoolers, high school students, observe the students, take notes, take very strategic notes, study your notes. You should see patterns over time that emerge. Challenging tasks promote maximum cognitive growth. These challenges should be within the child's CPD. So again, take note of what's the maximum that they can do independently take note of what they can do with assistance and challenge them to uh, stretch their skills, stretch their abilities. Now the hard part is for, for you as a teacher, for any um, task that you're going to give to students, a, a different students in your classroom might have a different ZPD here. And that ZPD is going to shift because as a student gains, gains new skill, now what that student used to be able to do maximum with assistance, now that child can do independently, but you've got a different uh, thing that that child can now do with assistance. Because remember, what the child can do um, with assistance today 
in the future, that child is going to be able to do independently. That's the whole goal here. But there's always going to be new room for growth, new room for improvement. Take the learning of math skills. Um, that child is going to learn as that child makes advancement. That child is going to get independence at new and increasingly difficult skills in math. But the learning never necessarily stops. Uh, there's always going to be uh, new and more difficult math skills that can be tackled. Same thing goes with reading. Same thing goes with writing. So knowledge is, like we've been talking about, this is a little bit of a review here. And just to touch bases with you, make sure that you're okay. Knowledge is constructed through problem solving. It is a joint activity. So in your classroom, if you're going to take the social constructivist approach, and we'll see video clips I'm going to give to you, um, and I'll also give you some articles that have been written related to this, of course. Uh, but you want to emphasize problem solving in your classes. You want to emphasize joint activities, group activities, collaborative learning with your students. You want to make sure that it is meaningful to students and that they can see the usefulness to this. Um, it is an active and constructive process. Uh, here we go further into what we mean by the zone of proximal development. Now, many people think that the zone of proximal development is practically the only thing that Vygotsky was writing about, ironically speaking. Um, he had relatively little to say, actually, about the zone of proximal development. Um, he wrote about it some in a book called Thought and Language, um, and Bruner uh, further developed his ideas in uh, Worsch and others, James Worsch and others. But um, zone of proximal development has become very popular in the education field, and so it's a tool that we use a great deal as teachers, but if you're going to study the work of Vygotsky, you have to understand that zone of proximal development is actually part of Vygotsky's larger look at how learning takes place. We talk about this as social cultural learning theory um, in, when you go a little bit deeper in the field. So remember, the key here with the ZPD is to remember that what a learner can do with guidance right now, in the future, the learner can do independently. Here is a little visual uh, representation of the ZPD. You can see in the blue uh, is what the learner can do without assistance. Um, in the white area um, is where you don't want to be. Uh, the learner cannot do this yet. Um, the zone of proximal development in this shaded area is the max. Uh, this light blue area is the max. Is the maximum of what they can do with assistance. Uh, so the, you see, the zone of proximal development is right in that area in between. That's where you want to be teaching. Um, but to that student um, with high goals, high expectations of growth. Eventually, this in this white area in here, this, this white area, you're going to see this blue circle, what the learner can do unaided, that's going to shift over here. Um, and so it's going to be growing, it's going to be shifting, but now there's going to be a new ZPD. So, and that's why it's so important to stretch the students, to encourage them to grow, but also ongoing assessment. Because if you assume that that ZPD is the same for a certain task that you're doing, is the same six months from now as it is right now, you're going to, again, leave that student bored and possibly feeling frustrated because that ZPD may shift. And so your instruction needs to shift along with it. You can see a little bit uh, further of a visual uh, here on, on this, um, the things the learner can do on his own. Then you've got the ZPD, the things that the learner can do with help. Um, and then you've got things the learner cannot do. A little bit more about the zone of proximal development. Um, 
learning is very much aided by guidance and assistance that is within the ZPD. And there can be many forms of guidance. Think alouds, tips, clues, tips um, can all be forms of guidance and assistance. The ZPD applies not only to experts working with novices, but also with peers, with students. So the students can provide help to each other. And in fact, in a social constructivist classroom, you've got a lot of collaborative learning that takes place. Okay, so think back to yourselves. Um, what are ways to assess students' learning within the ZPD? Um, we'll study that further into this course. Um, we could talk about informal assessments. Um, might include things like have students write down ideas, write down their thoughts. Um, you might have more formal assessments where you give a short quiz. Um, so, but again, you're always looking for growth. So you want to help students accomplish a complex task with assistance when you're scaffolding student learning. Uh, this assistance can be physical in terms of um, a physical tool, a phys uh, like a ruler, um, a calculator can be a form of scaffold for, uh, for children when you're talking about math skills. It can be mental or can come from adults and peers. Scaffolding, in a nutshell, is where the more knowledgeable other, such as a teacher or a peer, provides a type of structured-based assistance. We deal with motivation here. Uh, motivation, I, um, you want your students to be motivated in their learning. Um, one way of looking at motivation is that if you're confident that you can do a task, you're going to be more motivated to do that task even when it gets challenging. On the other hand, if you lack confidence and you're capable of doing that task, you're going to be less motivated. So ident identities and motivation are formed by participation in a group. Children can be motivated to learn by participating in communities where learning is valued. It's, uh, it's through others we become ourselves. That's one tenet in social constructivism. Learning is thought of as very much social. You want to emphasize the social aspect of learning. We can often complete harder tasks when someone else is there with us than we could uh, when we're on our own. So you emphasize collaborative learning, group presentations, group work a great deal in a social constructivist approach to teaching. The teacher considers just exactly how much scaffolding to give students and when to eventually withdraw it. Because remember, again, you're not shooting for learned helplessness. There does come a point in time when you gradually withdraw the assistance as that student becomes independent. And you push for what's thought about authentic learning, make it meaningful uh, to that student's own lived experience so that students can see, okay, ah, this is where it matters. Here's where I can apply it. As the student explores concepts um, using different methods in different contexts, that student uh, develops richer understandings. That includes multimodal. It includes the visual, taste, sound, touch. As we make sense and explore things in different ways, we are able uh, to build a different, richer context. Um, same thing goes with this talk that I'm giving to you about the ZPD and scaffolding. When you actually see it in action with videos, um, it will make more sense to you than just simply watching this PowerPoint and listening to me talk. And then beyond that, if you apply it in action and reflect on the effectiveness of you implying it in action as an actual classroom teacher and grow and develop from there, it'll make far more sense to you. 
um, with your students. If they are making sense of things in digital ways, using technology, is then writing, then reading about it, then dialoguing about it, that multiple way of making meaning will help students um, gain a deeper, richer understanding. So think for a second to yourself and um, possibly if you're if we're doing if you're using this discussion as part of a group activity you might even break off into groups hypothetically because I do share this with other people uh, but how can instruction within the CPD encourage culturally responsive instruction uh, that cult to be culturally responsive means that you respond to the needs and interests of students of diverse backgrounds and valuing cultural diversities of students. Think about that for a moment. Maybe even pause this video uh, briefly if you're watching this without being in the group. Uh, maybe even pause this video and think for a second. How would this um, help you to be culturally responsive? I'll tell you, uh, if you are doing this teacher-centered approach to teaching, lecture-based approach to teaching where you're passive, the students don't have any opportunity to respond in cultural ways and to tell you, here's how it's making sense to me given my background. If you're giving students a chance to dialogue, a chance to talk, make meaning with peers, make meaning with, with others. What you're also doing is you're giving them a chance to draw on their culturally rooted cues and background knowledge and funds of knowledge. And therefore you're sending the hidden curriculum that, and hidden curriculum is a way of looking at what are the hidden messages, the values, the moral based hidden messages that are within your curriculum. Remember, we've got different ways in which the curriculum is put together. You've got your planned curriculum. That's what you put down in writing in your lesson plan. Um, you've got your um, curriculum that you deliver, your enacted curriculum, but you've also got a hidden curriculum. If your students never have a chance to share their culturally grounded, socially grounded, familial grounded, community grounded ways of learning with you, the hidden curriculum is that those things don't matter. If they do have a chance to share and you treat that as a rich, informative, meaningful part of the curriculum, the hidden curriculum is that their cultural background matters. So think to yourself about what are some of the challenges to teaching within the ZPD in your content area and grade area and how you can overcome these. For beginning teachers, very bluntly, for many beginning teachers, the teacher-centered approach is more attractive partly because it's the approach that tends to be favored in schools and also until you gain more mastery and practice at teaching within the ZPD it can be a little bit scary because what are you doing you're turning students loose to talk and so then in the background mind of many beginning teachers is okay what if they get distracted what if they talk about other things what if they talk about video games or uh, what if they talk about some TV show that they watched or sports or uh, whatever um, the answer is yes, they probably will at times, but if they're focused and engaged in their activity, you can quickly turn their attention back to that. Maybe, I know when I'm collaborating with my peers, sometimes the topic does veer away to a little bit of small talk, but then we quickly, if we're interested in what we're doing, we're, we'll quickly work our way back. That's human nature. Don't be afraid of your students too much. Um, many beginning teachers are so afraid of noise, they're so afraid of the worst case scenarios that the ZPD and the scaffolding and this interactive approaches that uh, we're talking about here are honestly scary. Um, if you're sometimes administration, to be very honest, if you've got a principal that 
one little sign of noise in the classroom and your principal will throw a fit. Sometimes teaching with the ZPD can be scary because when you do group learning, group collaborative activities, hands-on, working with tools and different students at different workstations around the classroom, your classroom could potentially become noisy. That noise can be a sign that learning is taking place. But um, it's a type of creative chaos. And so sometimes that can be scary. And sometimes a person just walking into your classroom um, without taking a good look around can get the wrong idea. So how can these challenges be overcome? It starts with confidence. It's training. It's experience. You will become better at managing the classroom and implementing these type of strategies with training, with knowledge, with experience. Um, and as you become a veteran teacher, you'll become more skilled uh, to the point where these things don't scare you. But I'll be honest, as a first year teacher, I made mistakes myself as a first year teacher when I was uh, when I was a brand new K through 12 teacher. Um, honestly speaking, People, you know, like for instance, professors who have never been in a K through 12 classroom, who have never struggled in the K through 12 setting as an actual classroom teacher, they can, uh, the danger is that these strategies can sound like it's easy um, to, uh, to a professor who's never been in the setting. I'm a strong believer that if you're gonna prepare people on how to do this, you need, you've got to have some experience in the K through 12 teaching yourself like I do. Um, because it, I know it can be scary. I've experienced times when as a first year teacher, I've tried to implement these strategies and I wasn't as skilled and things got out of hand. Keep your calm. Um, if things begin to get out of hand, you learn strategies, learn techniques to think aloud to redirect so that things get back together. But that means students have to see meaning. They have to see purpose because of course, it's naturally more attractive to talk about some movie that you enjoy than to talk about academic material potentially. So if you're gonna redirect that student to talk about academic material, the academic material has to be of some interest to the student. You become more, um, skilled at doing that as you gain more experience, but it starts with uh, the background knowledge. It starts with the cues. You can gain students' interest if they are interested from the beginning. It's very hard to get a student interested in a task late if they were not interested from the beginning. And then if you're just using the grade or <laughs> discipline referral as a threat late when they're not engaged, now you've got a problem. And uh, one important form of classroom management, again, is engagement from the start. So we talk about affective forms of learning. Remember, affective deals with the emotions. It deals with the appeal in an artistic way, for instance. We have to consider the emotional aspects of meaning making. Remember that emotions, as well as logic, play a huge role in students' learning. Think about things like frustration, patience, confidence, all of this deals with whether a student will be motivated and it deals with um, a student's learning level. Um, when you're assessing material that might have been um, not adequately learned by students, think about were the students frustrated at the time that they were uh, learning the material? Because frustration will hinder learning. Um, a student can successfully resolve uh, things like cognitive dissonance through a process of reevaluating their choices and concepts. Cognitive dissonance is when you've got two different uh, things and uh, two different demands and uh, they conflict with each other. So here are some implications. The classroom is thought of as a learning community. Um, by learning community, it's a community with common rules, common expectations, common understandings with the goal of learning this content. 
joint activity within this community requires students uh, to work towards common shared goals. And these achievement of shared goals depend upon collaboration. So therefore, you've got to instill a sense within the students that collaboration is valued. Here's how we collaborate. You might want to coach, especially if you're dealing with middle schoolers, ahead of time, coach and train students on how to collaborate, um, methods of collaborating, methods of thinking aloud, methods of helping one another. So here are some implications for curriculum planning. Your aim is to engage students in productive, meaningful activities in the classroom that are personally as well as socially significant to the student. Remember, it's not just coverage of the curriculum, it's learning. Big difference between the two. Teach the student, not the agenda. The agenda matters, but the learning is what's really important. Uh, specific knowledge and skills make it the curriculum should be seen as this type of toolkit for you. Knowledge and skill can be used in knowing in action when carrying out activities of personal and social significance. Knowing in action means you know it in the process of putting it in action. The learning outcomes should be planned with prior agreement to your goals. When you set, when you set your uh, learning outcomes on your lesson plan, we'll study more about lesson planning as we go along in this course, uh, it's got to be tied with assessment. Your outcomes are emergent. They are active, just like the ZPD is emergent. It's active in context. Um, outcomes of activity cannot be completely known or prescribed in advance. That's a difference maybe from behaviorism. Remember, this is also a constructivist outlook on learning outcomes, not so much a behavioristic outlook on outcomes. Because remember, in behaviorism, you very much set the goals, the outcomes in advance. Um, so again, notice the difference between um, ways of meaning making the difference between theories because this bubble point about uh, the outcomes cannot be completely known or prescribed in advance, social constructivists would say yes, of course it cannot be described in advance because the activities are so flexible, learning is messy, how in the world can we know that two days from now this is precisely what the students will learn. You might have to make adjustments in a behavioristic um, of classroom. You've got everything very much closely aligned, closely prescribed, and you should be able to know that based upon um, doing everything the exact way, here's the learning outcome that we should exactly anticipate. So, and again, it's okay if you come out of my courses uh, thinking in a very behavioristic way. I do want to point out at times when there are contradictions between behaviorism and constructivism, uh, because honestly speaking, most of your professors in most of your classes that you take at the university level, whether it's undergrad or graduate, most of us have a tendency to be social constructivist with exceptions. For instance, if you're teaching in the um, exceptional education field. Uh, many professors in the exceptional education field might be more behavioristic um, in terms of Skinner, but in the actual classroom, K through 12 classroom in the real world, many, whether they realize it or not, uh, many of the uh, lesson plan, the curriculum design and expectations of your principals and your school leaders might be very much behavioristic. Um, and be based on behaviorism. And so it's important to know the difference. And notice this bubble here, this bullet point here, outcomes and activities cannot be completely known and prescribed in advance. Be careful with that, because from a constructivist point of view, that's very true. But most of your principals, when you are a working classroom teacher, most of your principals will want to see a very precise um, a learning goal, learning outcome, precisely stated 
on your lesson plan and you should be able to measure whether that outcome is taking place or not, why or why not. Um, and so please don't use this bubble point, this bullet point I'm using as a way of getting into a fight with your principal. Uh, and in fact, I will want you when you do lesson plans to have outcomes that are stated. Uh, but just know that from a constructor's point of view, these outcomes can be flexible. So, um, and the reason they're flexible is because here, you want to explore challenges as they are encountered. Uh, you, when a key learning uh, moment takes place, you jump on that learning moment for a student. Um, if you're inflexible, if you're rigid, you might lose that learning opportunity. So in closing, um, think to yourself, what is the most important point we discussed today? And in what ways can instruction within the CPD benefit student learning? Uh, if you're in my class and you are doing a little article reflections that go along with this video, these two bullet points here, these two question marks would be a good way of guiding your reflections for the week. Um, if you want added help beyond what I'm going to be posting, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm going to erase this. I made this one uh, before I switched schools. That's um, obviously my UALR address is, is wakerns at ualr.edu. I, um, I've been doing this lesson for, um, um, I should have caught that. I've been doing this lesson for an hour now, but I'm not going to erase this video because I think this is a really good useful video for you, but remember it's wakerns at uallr.edu, not this address you see right here. Okay, so um, talk to you later. Have a good day.